We're glad to have all of our visitors with us and certainly glad to see Brett and Barbara back. I told Brett earlier, I said, it's good to see you front and back. And we're very grateful that we can be together this morning to worship our God according to His will in this assembly gathered for that purpose. I want to read a passage of Scripture that will serve as our text for the sermon this morning. Found in John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Maybe we should remind ourselves that in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, we have the record of our Lord in a private personal conversation with His apostles. Primarily to cause them to understand that He was going to go away in the sense He would die. And, of course, he would rise from the dead the third day and then send back to heaven. You've got to understand, they didn't understand what we now know, when we know the Word of God correctly, 2 Timothy 2.15, as to Jesus, as to the kingdom, the nature of it, and so forth. So with that in mind, then you know who he's speaking to in John 15, 12 through 13, or 17. And it begins, This is my commandment that ye love one another. And then he gives them an example because they could remember being with him for almost three years, day in and day out. They could remember what he did, how he did it, what he said, how he dealt with people. That you should love one another as I love you. Then he says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you, henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. There is a wealth of material here. We cannot cover it all in one sermon. I suggest that in your private studies you give a lot of thought to what is said explicitly in just the words we read. And then what all they imply as you bring other verses in the Bible to bear upon the same thoughts that our Lord taught here. What I want to zero in out of these on these in this passage this morning is the matter of a friend. And to pose the question, are we, am I, are you a friend of Jesus? Are you a friend of Jesus? Friend is one of those words that if you were to ask somebody like we do sometimes in class and gets rather interesting when we do, very common word and say, what does it mean? Give us a definition of the word friend. I think you might find it again difficult to be able to define in a few words. And so we pose here, what did Jesus have in mind when he said this? That's what I want to know. And then when John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who the Apostle John actually heard him say this when the Holy Spirit guided him to pen these words of Jesus. What did he understand about it? Because he was on the receiving end when Jesus said, you're my friend. The Greek for you friends, remembering the Koine Common Greek of the first century, was what the New Testament was written in. You friends comes from philus. Philus has to do with the idea of beloved, of someone dear to you. And if you look it up, it'll say friendly. <laughs> Notice that he tells them what he means by saying that you are my friends. I chose you. You are my friends. He said, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. Now that gives me an insight and to what he means when he uses this word, beloved or dear. Notice he contrasts friends with 
servants, which is from the Greek word doulos. It means a bond servant. And he's saying, of course, in many places that you are my servants. He makes it clear even here that to be what you ought to be to me and for me to be your true friend, you must obey me. So what he's going to do here is not say, oh, you're not a slave to me. You are. But he's saying, here's how you know I, I, that you're more than just what a slave is. And they knew what that was very well all around them. They were slaves. And what he means is, is that a friend is somebody you can fight in. Somebody that you trust so that you can, we might say it today in a common way, you can unload on. You can talk to, you can deal with, you take him into your inner circle. That's the closeness involved. For all that I have heard of my Father that I have made known to you. He says that so they'll understand that this is why I call you my friend. So it doesn't remove the idea that they must obey him. He's going to tell them in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, you keep my commandments. The only proof of true love of Christ or God is to render obedience to him. To take him at his word and comply with his will. To obey him. And that ought to cause us to remember what the writer of Ecclesiastes said when he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For well, this is the whole duty of man, or this is the duty of man. So he's not saying you're not a servant. He's saying if you are my friend, I'm a friend to you, then here's how it is. I, as apostles, cho choosing you for a certain thing, I have revealed to you all these things. See, others didn't know this. He had revealed it to them because of what he chose them to do. So that's how he describes a friend. If you look at a... Uh, modern dictionary, I looked it up in Merriam-Webster to get a modern definition, how we use the word friend. It says one attached to another by affection or esteem. It even says acquaintance. And then it says one that is not hostile. One that is of the same nation, party, or group. Carrying with the idea that people have things in common. Then it says one that favors or promotes something as a charity. And then it says a favored companion, and I think the last one fits more what the Greek meant here and what our Lord was saying. I've chosen you because I know you, I know what you are, I know everything about you to do a specific work. Some time ago on Sunday morning, we emphasized the work of the apostles of Jesus Christ. It was singular in what they did. We pointed out then that they are the ambassadors of the court of heaven. That is, by their being baptized in the Holy Spirit, Christ, through the agency of the Spirit, gave us the whole New Testament system. The early church understood that before a word of it was written down. Because on the day the church started, Luke records for us in Acts 2.42 that the disciples continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching. They knew that Jesus was working through these apostles to give them His will so they would know how to live. Well, we don't have apostles walking this earth today in human form, but we have the apostles' doctrine in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. And it still says the same thing today it did when they uttered it out of their mouths by guidance of the Holy Spirit so it would be infallibly set out. So when we see this business of friend defined, we see it somebody close, somebody he trusts, that is in this case with the apostles, Somebody that he can commit a specific thing to be done, and it will be done. That's very important to understand as to understanding a friend. And maybe that should cause us then more to understand how we should view who is really our friends. And we often say, make friends. Well, maybe this ought to tell us the criteria upon which we determine somebody is our friend. For we see how Jesus viewed it. And we ask the question again that's our subject for this morning's sermon. Are you a friend of Jesus? And that's a good question. So we see then that friends are a very important and we can say wonderful part of our life on earth. But again I emphasize this means in view of what we've studied so far that we should be very careful in choosing who our friends are. And by what criteria we determine who they are. 
Do we expect a friend to condone everything we think, say, and do and never utter a word of disagreement? Well, you see, that immediately means you could really never be what you ought to be with friends like that. If you read through our Lord dealing with the apostles, He could be quite severe with them sometimes and rebuking them. Was He unfriendly to them when He did that? Or was He showing them you can't continue on that path, you can't continue to believe these things and be what you ought to be to God? But by far then, the most important friend that you can have is of course our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, we have a number of hymns that we sing sometimes to remind us of that. I think of two of hymns that are older and probably more familiar to all of us. What a friend we have in Jesus. Then there's another one, although there are others. These came to mind. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Why do we sing those songs? Why did anybody ever write them? What crossed their mind to make them think about this? It's because somebody had an idea of what the New Testament taught about a friend, the definition of it, and who really is your friend. There were a lot of folks think that they had friends and they found out they didn't. But if we will follow the Lord's will, it's like anything else. We'll learn better what a friend is, who is our friend, and really we don't want somebody telling us, well, being what we call a yes man, Anything I want to do, yeah, that's fine. Greatest thing ever done. How do you think of it? And every time you get that kind of thing. Let me tell you your best friend if you're married. And I just gave it away. If you're what you're supposed to be as a wife and a husband, I say supposed to be what the Bible teaches, then your best friend is your husband or your wife. Now can you guess why? Especially your wife. She's going to say, don't wear that. It looks terrible on you. Because you immediately, you immediately say, you're not my friend. And you can take it from there and go on to where you can, you can know if you're what you ought to be in your attitude as the Bible teaches it toward your wife or your husband. You know that they're saying that because they love you and they're giving you an objective viewpoint. And you need to listen. Well, I might point out too, sometimes your enemies can do you that favor. It's just sometimes when they do it, they're seeking to do you hurt. So it's good to even pay attention to your enemies. They hate you enough to tell you exactly what you don't want to hear. But your wife is a friendly critic. Your husband is a friendly critic. If they're what they ought to be, as the Bible teaches, husband-wife roles... Yes, they may tell you that's, that's not the best thing to say or you shouldn't have said that or don't act that way. Well, what about parents to children? You think parents, being what the Bible says parents ought to be, are friendly to their children? I got in just in time to hear Ken talk about how much his parents beat him all his life. And it might be like some others, and Nancy might agree with this, they didn't beat him enough. <laughs> uh, what would you tell that why does that come out in the passage he was studying when it comes about, about wisdom and listening to others to have wisdom because they have what I don't have can you benefit from others who've been places done things, suffered things you sure can if you can't just tear the book of Proverbs out of your Bible or at least never read it so we need to understand that about friendship, about who is a friend, about the criteria laid out in the scriptures of a friend. And we can see it when we ask the question and answer it, are you a friend of Jesus? It's not a mutual thing when you consider the answer to, are you a friend of Jesus? That is, when you look at Jesus' attitude toward us and us toward him in the area of friendship. In fact, have you noticed in your study of the Bible that although God and the Lord Jesus call certain ones, let me emphasize it, their friends. Now notice this, that no human ever refers to God or Jesus as his or her friend. Have you ever noticed that? 
Well, if you didn't, study your Bible a little more. That's always good for you. That's how you learn. It's not a mutual, reciprocal friendship. Now watch it. The Bible refers to both Abraham, 2 Chronicles 27, Isaiah 41, 8, James 2, 23, and Moses, Exodus 33, 11, as friends of God. And in our sermon text, Jesus calls the apostles his friends. But again, this buddy concept that we tend to think about friends today can't be connected with that. Because even though Jesus called the apostles his friends, Jesus was also their Lord and teacher, John chapter 13, 13 and 14. You see, sometimes we get the idea, if you're my friend, as I said earlier, you know, it's just a good old boy thing. Uh, a friend comes over and helps me work on the car on Saturday. If you have that concept of Jesus being your friend, you have a wrong concept. At the Last Supper, we see the Apostle John with his head laid on Jesus' breast. But, we must remember that years later when John saw Jesus and all His majesty and glory, in Revelation 1 verse 17, John falls at his feet as a dead man. Does that begin to tell us being Jesus' friend is not like your fishing buddy. So when we consider whether or not we are friends of Jesus, we need to keep in mind the great, magnificent, holy reverence that John and others had for Jesus Christ. It may help us understand better what a friend is. A friend will tell other people what he knows they do not want to hear because it's necessary that they hear it for their own good. Let me ask you a question. Reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, did Jesus ever do that? Seems rather routine. And yet we get personally upset if somebody takes the Bible and points out something in our life that is contrary to what God says we ought to be, and yet we're saying, I'm a Christian. But remember the word Christian means one who is of Christ. To be of Christ, one must be living like the Bible says. Well, if I'm calling myself a Christian, but I'm not doing what the Bible says, truly and honestly, am I? And if I'm not, am I a friend of Jesus? The question I want you to think about and ask yourself would Jesus himself call me his friend by the way I'm thinking and speaking and living today? The way I'm using the abilities I have? Whatever it is that's coming to my power to use, would he and does he, does he right now, by the way I'm living, by my conduct, does he call me his friend? Because you see, Jesus is just not automatically your friend or everyone's friend. And we especially need to know that particular point. If we are inclined to think that we are his friend simply because I'm a good person. Many times when we, that's another thing about good, you say, would you tell me what you mean by good? So common little words that are very important sometimes get hard to define. And you have to know what people think about it. Somebody says, I'm your friend. I want that person to tell me, well, what does that mean on your part toward me? If you're good, well, what does that mean in the way you think and say and do if you're a good person? So, being a good person, I don't know what all that means to certain people. Usually it means something like, I'm harmless, I don't hurt anybody. <laughs> I pay my bills. And so on and so forth. But remember... That doesn't necessarily mean that I'm Jesus' friend. The Bible teaches that we're all God's enemies because He's holy. And we all have sinned. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And James, and that book Romans was written to Christians, remember, not those outside of Christ, not those that are still in their alien sins, not Christians. 
Then notice what is said by James. And that's another letter written to members of the Lord's church, to Christians. And he says pretty strong language, ye adulterers, ye adulteresses. Now watch what he says. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity or hate with God. Now he makes his application. Whosoever, now it's as broad as the race of man. Whosoever, whosoever therefore, in the light of this, here's the conclusion, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James 4 verse 4. So before I say, well Jesus is everybody's friend. James says he's not. And James was inspired the Holy Spirit writing part of the New Testament of Jesus Christ himself. The Bible assures us that we cannot have a worse enemy than God. The writer of Hebrews writing to Jewish Christians who because of persecution were actually thinking about leaving the whole New Testament system. And he says if you do that, here's how he describes their relationship with God. In Hebrews 12 and verse 29, to people who decide to do that, and that would cover anybody who knows they're sinners, and won't change, won't comply with God's will. For our God, our God, is a consuming fire. Now it bothers me when I hear people talk about, well, God loves us so much. Well, He does. But I want to know what the Bible teaches about that love. And I know that God's love for me does not loose me from studying His Word, understanding it, and rendering obedience to it. The whole purpose of the book of Hebrews is to keep people living according to the truth of God. These aren't people who hadn't heard of Jesus. They had heard and had such faith in Him that they repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Him, and were baptized for the remission of their sins. The Lord added them to the church. They are Christians. But they're about to lose it all because they're not willing to continue to be faithful even though they're undergoing great persecution. The Bible assures us then that we can't have a worse enemy than God. We don't want God to be our enemy. God is always right, people. God's always right. And His ultimate will is going to be done. Somebody said one time, well, we can believe in God and Christ and the Bible is the Word of God and not obey Him. And at the end of time, God's will is going to be done. And we're going to be punished. Or we can love Him. We can believe Him. We can obey Him. We can live godly lives. And at the end of time, His will is going to be done. And we'll be blessed. And that's what's set before every one of us this room. And every accountable person in the whole world. Is that very thing. The good news is that God sent Jesus to reconcile rebellious sinners to Himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. Now in that sense, you can say He's a friend to everybody. But that's not the sense that He's using the word friend in our text when He talks to the apostles. He's a friend in the sense He's made possible for us to be saved from our sins. And He and He alone could do what was necessary to do that. And thus he would say, as he did in our text, greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. But I'm not his friend if I don't appreciate that and love him for it and have faith in him based upon his word, Romans 10, 17. And I'm willing to follow him wherever he leads me. I'm willing to obey him at all costs. So he's made it possible for us to be friends. And in that sense, he befriended all men. But in the true meaning of the word friend, as he describes it in our text, and we studied a moment ago in the beginning of this sermon, as he spoke to his apostles, no, he's not that with everybody. Because he said in that same text, you're my friends if you do what I tell you. I suggest to you parents when you're rearing your children, that it's a great time to teach that kind of love to your children. Your children need to obey you because you're worthy of their trust that, they're not going to, that you're not going to lead them astray. That you're going to teach them and train them. That you're going to set a godly example before them. That you're going to show them the right way of moral and spiritual living. And that involves corrective discipline. And for a good while in their lives, they've just got to take you at your word 
And why should they do what you said? Because you told them to. I don't like it when I hear these psychologists say, now you've got to explain to them why they must do what you said. Try that with a two-year-old. Just sit down and go through a long process of logical reasoning with him and see where it gets you. Well, a whole lot of us in the family of God, the Lord's church, aren't much ahead of that when it comes to what God expects of us. And thus, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Command that I will obey is the perfect example of one of us and all of us being faithful to God as He expects. Learning to take God at His word. The self-righteous, the religious crowd of His day that scoffed at Jesus was a friend of the devil. Jesus was a friend of sinners because He taught them what they needed to cease doing and what they needed to do. Nobody is your friend if they let you just go wherever you want to go, do whatever you want to do. Does that begin to tell you how the home is falling apart? Mom and daddies, if they love their children like the Bible talks about it, and they have a responsibility as the Bible lays it upon their shoulders to bring up their children in a nurtured admonition of the Lord, aren't going to just let them do as they please. Our nation is eating up with that today. Everybody is for the criminal. You ever notice that? The idea is that you don't punish a person because that person has done objective wrong and that means you must be punished. That didn't say you couldn't be forgiven of it, but you must meet the consequences of your actions. That is not the attitude in our nation today. It's trying to justify anybody doing anything, no matter what it is. There's no accountability. Everything is, is just good. People riot, and they're good. People murder, they're good. And on and on you can go. And it creates complete lunacy insofar as people functioning as God intended in this life. And we don't want that to get into the Lord's church. We don't want people we're preaching the gospel to to think that, well, God's grace, His favor, just means I can sin and sin and sin and God's just going to keep pouring out His grace on me. You know, that's dealt with in the beginning of chapter 6 of the book of Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound. And the Holy Spirit through Paul said to those Christians, God forbid, in the Greek it means it may it never be so. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Meaning that at repentance after you'd believed in Christ on the basis of the gospel message, Romans 10, 17, Acts 17, 30, that you realize a great change of life beginning in your inward man must take place. That's why it's called conversion. Go out here and you buy your real nice convertible. And you know why you do that? So you can put the top down. So the first time you drive it off, the top won't come down at all. Now, is that a convertible? In our definition of convertible, it fits a car. No. Well, what about the person who says, I'm a Christian. And what that does for me, because the grace of God's been extended to me through the gospel and I've obeyed it, that means I can do anything I want to. And God's grace will just keep covering it. So, why try? Well, we tend to call that very cheap grace. It's not the Bible doctrine of grace. Grace favors us. In the sense the gospel plan of salvation is made possible to us. And in believing it, we're transformed. Because we resolve at repentance to die to a practiced life of sin. And to turn to a practiced life of learning His will and doing it. And anything we see out of harmony with it, we'll straighten it up. The first step to being called the friend of Jesus is where a lot of people mess up. But it's to come to him as a helpless person who knows he or she's lost in sin and in need of salvation. And only Jesus Christ through the gospel can provide it. A person who's willing to take him at his word and not argue with him. And upon understanding from his word what my responsibility is to comply with his terms of pardon is set out. In the gospel plan of salvation. Now that's the attitude of a person 
who comes to Jesus. And the first step of being able to be a friend of Jesus. And once we've obeyed the gospel in believing in Christ, confessing our sins, having repented of our sins, and having been baptized into Christ, immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins. That's the beginning point. That's being born into the kingdom, John 3, 3 and 5. Now we're ready because we're in a state of favor in the Lord's church to which He added us. We obeyed the gospel, Acts 2.47. Now we're able to strive with all of our might to learn and do the will of God, knowing God understands and knows what we've done in becoming a Christian and now what we are as a Christian. Once you've done that, then you can start considering more closely things what we're talking about now. How to be a friend. How you develop the characteristics of a friend. And the first thing, and I'll cover it while there are various characteristics, and that'll cover everything else that we might study, and that is friends of Jesus obey His commandments, John 15, 14. Have you ever noticed that virtually everybody that really is against Jesus but wants to be saved by Jesus fights at obeying Him? And you hear people saying, oh, you're just a commandment keeper. Thank you. I'll take that as a, as a great compliment. What are you, not a commandment keeper? You're a legalist. Well, I know by legalist from the scriptures, they mean somebody that made laws for God and bounded on them. That's what a real legalist is. But you know, I like being legal. Are you against being legal? If you really don't want to be legal, just don't get your driver's license and drive anyway. So I like being legal rather than illegal. But being legal spiritually is to have an attitude that is always ready to take your Lord's word and comply with it, whatever he demands. John 15, 14, remember? Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. But what if you don't? Are you still his friend? Not according to Jesus himself. And that, of course, is repeating the thought of John 15, 10, where he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Well, what's this business about love allows you to disobey him and he loves you so much you're still saved? The Lord never said anything like that. All you have to do is read your Bible and know it's God's word and believe it. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. Now watch. He gives them an example. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now there it is. You can't say you love the Lord all the time disobeying Him. It doesn't work. You can't say I have faith in Christ to save me. But you don't obey Him. The proof of one's faith in Christ is obedience to His will. Read James chapter 2. Faith apart from works is dead being alone. The devils will even tremble. <laughs> They're still devils. So it's more than just mentally affirming that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's an attitude change. It says, I will obey Him whatever He tells me to do. And that's why you have in Hebrews 5 that He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. They're the ones that love Him. Oh, you say you love Him, but I don't think I have to obey Him. You don't love Him. Be fair with yourself. If you've been taught that, you don't love Him. If you love Him, you'll keep His commandments. Jesus' friends obey Him. Now I ask you, are you a friend of Jesus? Jesus' friends, according to His own words, obey Him. I ask you, as you stand before God now, or I may say sit before God, do you obey Him? He's not friends with any who live in disobedience to His will. On one occasion, you'll remember that our Lord's mother and brothers in the flesh, half-brothers in the flesh, arrived to see Him at a time when the people had crowded into a house to listen to Him. And somebody told Him that His mother and brothers were outside looking for Him. And as He often did, He gave an answer that must have jolted them in Mark 3 and verse 33. Your mama and brothers are out there, and what's His reply? Oh, who are my mother and brothers? Is he crazy? Doesn't he know his own mother and brothers? Well, he took the occasion to teach a lesson. He looked around at those who were listening receptively to his teaching. 
And he continued to shock all who heard him by answering his own question, Mark 3, 34 through 35. He looked at all those listening to him, hungering and thirsting, hanging on every word. And he said, Behold my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now let me ask you, could language be more simple yet so clear and how bold it is and how it refutes so many people that call themselves a friend of Jesus? But they say you don't have to obey Him. Jesus' true friends are those who obey Him. Now I said, we asked the question at the beginning, are you a friend of Jesus? Well now let me ask you, do you qualify? Notice when Abraham became a friend of God. When Abraham became a friend of God. And we learn this not from Genesis in the Old Testament in Moses' account of Abraham's life. Although we can. But we learn it from the inspired James writing part of the New Testament and writing it to those already Christians to teach them a lesson. In James 2, 21 through 24, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? That's a question. When I see him or I read here, he says, Seest thou? I say, Do you see? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now listen. And he was called a friend of God. Now when was he called the friend of God? When he said, God exists. Yes, I know that's what God said. It was when he obeyed God. And then James pulls it all together. And says to those he wrote to and to all of us since he was writing part of the New Testament, and specifically this was those who were members of the church. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Again, James 2, 21 through 24. Now when was Abraham a friend of God? When he immediately affirmed from the facts that God exists? Or was it when he from the heart obeyed God in whatever it was God said? And notice what God had called him to do. Take thy son, thine only son, thy son whom thou lovest, and offer him a burnt offering on old Mount Moriah. Brethren, we need to do a lot of studying on the definition of a friend as the Bible defines it, but especially when we ask the question, am I a friend of Jesus Christ? Do I really qualify to be a friend? Because Jesus searching our minds even now from His throne in heaven knows whether we are where we are. And if we have the view you don't have to obey Him, I guarantee you, you are not a friend of Jesus. No matter how kindly affectioned emotionally you may think you are. If your love will not render obedience in your life to His will, you're not a friend of Jesus Christ. But you don't have to leave this auditorium this morning remaining His enemy. You can take him at his word as we studied in this sermon. Obey the gospel of Christ and being baptized for the remission of sins and live a faithful Christian life in the church to which he will add you when you obey the gospel. The Lord's church that you read of in your New Testament. The church that he built, Matthew 16, 18. The church that he purchased with his own precious blood, Acts 20, verse 28. The blood that he shed for the remission of our sins on Calvary's cross and we contact it when we're baptized into his death for in his death he shed his blood. That's why we're raised the water to the grave of baptism. To walk in newness of life. And we're his friends when we do that. And remain faithful to him and his spiritual body, the church, all the days of our life. And when we die in that condition, our Lord can say to us, we stand before him in the judgment. That is as certain as you hear my voice now. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. That will be said to his friends on the day of judgment. And his friends are those who take him at his word and comply with his will no matter what he asks. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to do that now. If as a child of God you sin, there's a second law of pardon. And that is you must repent of those sins and pray God for forgiveness having confessed it. 
And we urge you to think about that and ask yourself the question, am I a friend of Christ? Do I qualify? Well, qualify before you leave this building today. All together we stand and sing, come to Jesus. <laughs>